Do you have a Bible? It's a good thing to bring in church, dangerous thing to bring into church. I want you to open it with me to the book of Colossians. Hallelujah. Stay in the spirit as long as the Lord will allow us to. Stay in the spirit. I wanted to talk about climbing the mountain of God. For in 2016, he will make our feet like hinds feet. We are raised to reign in 2016. We'll see whether or not we get there. But I want you to go to Colossians chapter number 1. With the revelation and understanding that we are about to inherit the promises of God. We're about to inherit the promised land. Somebody say real estate. We're about to inherit the promised land. God cares about land. Never, never really realized it, never saw it until he began to share with me the word for this year that we need to focus on land. God cares about land. But we're about to possess our promised land both spiritually and physically. We're about to possess the meek shall inherit real estate. But as we approach the apprehension of our promised inheritance, it is important for us to realize that only two of the twelve who actually saw what God promised came back and said it was good. Joshua and Caleb. I'll say that again. Only two out of twelve who saw what God promised, saw it with their own two eyes, came back and acknowledged that it was good. The rest acknowledged, yeah, there's some good stuff, but it's going to require some effort. See, that's the problem with the American church is they want the blessing without the effort. But the only place that you can start at the top is either grave digging or well digging. you got to understand that even Jesus started as a baby in a manger. But you can't leave him in that manger. You can't leave him in the dusty streets of Nazareth. You can't leave him on the old rugged cross or in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea because he was born to reign. And in the same way he was born to reign, you are born again to reign. But there's a process. We're working through it together. Are you in Colossians? Chapter number 1, verse number 9. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Oh, that indicates that some of us aren't that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in all knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Joyfulness always has a phrase attached to it. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son you wonder why we praise like we do if you really believe this you'd go crazy translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature now let's look, before we pray over this word here today, let's look at verse number 12 together, and let's read it together. Ready? Read. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the saints in light. Father, help us to be two of the twelve. We don't care what it's going to take. We don't care the effort required. The sacrifices to our flesh we say your plan is good ahead of time god before we see it we say it's good because you are good and your mercy endures forever in the name of jesus everybody said you can be seated and just say three times to three people it's good it's good it's good Romans chapter 5, verse 17, you don't have to turn there. They'll pull it up on the big screen for you. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. As we're getting that ready, you need to remember that 
God spoke to us and said, in the book of Revelation, the Bible speaks of a time when Satan will come down in great wrath. Somebody say, he's coming down. He's coming down in great wrath because he knows his time is short. Now, strategically and militarily, if you have your mind sharpened to the mind of Christ, and if your enemy is coming down, that means he is leaving his previous abode, and it is currently unguarded. Meaning, if you want to escape the attacks that will come on the church this year, if you want to escape the turmoil that will come on our nation this year, then you need to come up a little bit higher. God's raising us up to reign in 2016. Nudge your neighbor with the elbow right in their ribs and say, come on up a little bit higher. But you must despise not the day of small beginnings. You have to start where you are. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, for by one man's sin, death reigned by one Adam. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. Everybody say in life. Not after you die, in by one Jesus Christ. Jesus was born to reign. You were born again to reign. That's why you don't like having a boss. That's why you don't like somebody telling you what to do. There is something in your nature that says, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to tell people what to do because it's in your nature. You're not born to be told what to do. You, you, it, man, it is not in their nature to be enslaved because you must keep this word away from anyone who has had chains put on their hands or fetters on their feet because they have within their nature the desire to be free. And if you'll feed that nature with this word, they'll eventually break free from that bondage. But freedom is never granted voluntarily by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Nudge your neighbor again say, come on up a little bit higher. God is looking for people who will do what Adam did not do. God is looking for people who will follow in the footsteps of Jesus and understand that they have been predestined to succeed. You are more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens you. You have been predestined by God to be successful in whatever you put your hand to do, predetermined before the foundation of the world that whatever you did in 2016 would be greater, bigger, better than anything you've ever done in your life, predetermined. Therefore, if you do not succeed, it was of your own making. If you do not succeed and you're sitting in here this day or you're watching through that camera right there, it'll be because you heard this word and you ignored it and you walked away from it unchanged. You need to be praying right now, Lord, let this word change my heart. Let it change my life and the greatest miracle of all, let it change my mind. If you're married, you know how hard it is to change somebody's mind. God, let it change. That'll be the greatest miracle we ever receive if it changes your mind predestined to succeed. Here's what Revelation 3.21 says. He that overcomes, everybody say it's not everybody. But the believers that overcome, he says, they will be able to sit with me on my throne. Think about that. You, now, now, honestly, let's just, let's, just, let's just squash the casual Christianity we've been raised with that you can just casually go to church whenever you want to and read your Bible whenever you want to and just believe that Jesus is the Savior and everything's going to be all right and when you go to heaven, everything's going to be okay. Let's squash that right now. Do you think God is going to hand the keys of his kingdom over to somebody like that? Yeah, yeah. I suffered, bled, and died, rose from the dead, and watching over you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, praying for you, and you're going to live a casual life, and then I'm going to let you sit with me on my throne? You got to, the, what, what a dishonor that would be to the men and women who have laid their head in the guillotine. What, what a dishonor that would be to the men and women who have committed themselves, spirit, soul, and body, for them to receive the same reward as the casual buckle of the Bible belt Christian that lives today. What a dishonor that would be. What an, we serve a God of justice. What an injustice. What an injustice it would be for that martyr to stand next to that Stanley County believer and then both get the same reward. You got another thing coming. You have been born. Oh, don't, don't oh, see, I, I feel you now getting condemned and thinking about what you did. That's not you anymore. Who you were in 2015 is not who you are right now. 
His mercy is made new every morning. You have a fresh start. You have a new beginning. My God in heaven, you may have been lazy yesterday, but God sees you as a passionate pursuer today. Say, I receive that in Jesus' name. I don't know about you. I receive that. My God in heaven, I receive that. I will allow them to sit with me. Jesus had a journey from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, from the cross to the throne. He was not born on a throne, but he was born in a manger. And there is a process for you. You are born again with a kingly nature. You are born again to reign. You are born again to rule. That's who you are. It's in your nature. But God is not going to hand the keys of his brand new Bentley over to a five-year-old. Nor is he going to hand the keys of the kingdom over to some immature, lazy, backbiting, gossiping, refusing to read Christian who says they love the Lord. He's not going to do it you got to start where you are. Jesus started as a baby, and he grew in wisdom and favor with God and with man. That is the danger of the worship movement. Anytime worship becomes your sole priority, idolatry is inevitable. Because when you focus merely on the worship, what you're doing is, is you're focusing merely on God's part. Because you can only worship when he's in the building anyway. When God shows up, it's easy to worship. When God shows up, it's easy just to lift your hands and talk about how much you love him and how unworthy you are. It's easy. Worship touches your emotions. It draws you in. Praise disgusts your carnal nature. Praise disgusts your carnal nature. If I were to stand up here and tell you a story that would bring tears to your eyes and bring Gabriel up here and he would sing a song that would minister to your low, sin-sick condition. It would be easy for you just to get in worship and tears falling and on your knees. Because it speaks to your emotion. Praise demands something of you that's not in your emotional, normal way of doing things. And this worship movement that focuses solely on that gravitates away from the word and away from the responsibility of the believer to stand in faith, to speak the word, to hold to doctrine, to study to show yourself approved, to get in the word, to lift your hands, to shout, to love one another. It, it, it draws you away from that and says, well, God understands that you're just so terrible and so it's okay. I digress. God is more interested in the production of character than he is in the provision of comfort. God is more interested in the production of character than he is in the provision of your comfort. I know you thought living on the mountain, oh, this is going to be so wonderful. It's going to be so easy. No, no, no. The difference is now on the mountaintop, you're not fighting the enemy. You're fighting the inner me. See, on, on the mountaintop, you're not fighting those devils anymore because they're under your feet. They're under your hinds' feet. Do I not get into that right now? They are under your feet, but now that you are at an altitude that they cannot reach, now you are faced with the glory of God that demands more of you. The closer you get to God, the more that is demanded of you. So now you have to struggle with your own carnality. Now you have to struggle with your own sinful nature. Now you have to look yourself, Atreyu, in the mirror and face yourself. Don't even know. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Pay attention, pay attention, because in these services, pay attention to the people who are talking, because they're the ones in the testimony services that will stand up and talk about what God did. Now, pay attention to the ones who aren't talking, because they're the ones that won't have ever have any testimony to share with anybody, because that's not their personality. Well, then testimonies aren't your personality either, so God will just, God will just save you from all of that. We're going to get this right in 2016. 
Everybody say, my inheritance is in light. Remember that? We read that earlier on, that my inheritance, we are, he has made us meet or able. That's what that means. He had to make us able. What a miracle. He made us able. You weren't before, but he supernaturally made you able to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Say, my inheritance is in light. So if you want your inheritance, if you want what God has promised you, you have to go where it is. And it is not in darkness. It is in. So let's see what light is now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Light is knowledge. Now, now I need you to stay with me here because I'm going to teach you just for a few minutes. Inheritance is in light. Light is knowledge. So your inheritance is released through Therefore, your greatest enemy, because Satan is the prince of darkness, if light is knowledge, then darkness is ignorance or stupidity, foolhardiness. So your greatest enemy then, oh hear me, is not sin, it is ignorance. The greatest adversary you have to entering into the promise of God is ignorance of the glory of the Lord in the face. And on the mountaintop, we about to see the glory. The greatest enemy is not sin, it is ignorance. So if you want less and less satanic activity in your life, then what you do is you push him out by growing in knowledge. More knowledge, less satanic activity. This puts the on us. On us. Okay. Go to Hosea chapter 4. Watch them, watch them. They'll get a miracle. Watch them. Just watch them. In fact, anytime somebody shouts at a service, you ought to nudge your neighbor whether you know him or not and say, watch them, watch them, watch them, watch them, watch them. Pay attention to them. Pay attention to them. Watch them. It could happen before they leave the building today. Watch them. Watch them. Something's happening in their life. Something's happening in their heart. Watch them. Glory. I can't do that. I get so caught up, I forget to turn to where I tell you to go. Watch them. Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Hallelujah. So light is. Light is. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You, my dear children, are the light. The reflected light of the knowledge. Now you are not. You are not light. If you be in darkness, that's a verse. See, if you are ignorant, you are not light. Okay. Hosea chapter 4, verse, well, let's look at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, no mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Verse 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of because you have rejected knowledge. Now wait, if you can reject it, that means knowledge is a choice. It's a decision. Knowledge is a choice, and ignorance is a choice. You can reject knowledge. Every time you're given a book and you don't read it, you have rejected knowledge. 
Oh, the men aren't very vocal right now. They're not saying amen. Every time the Holy Spirit prompts you to read his word and you don't do it, you have rejected knowledge. Every time we enter into a worship service, when God wanted us to get into the word, we have rejected knowledge. Now, I want you to look at God's response because this flies in the face of traditional Christianity, especially what you see on television and what you hear preached from the pulpits, even in the buckle of the Bible belt, because we talk about a God who's all-loving. I'm talking about the same God, all-loving, all-gracious, all-merciful, all-understanding, and he says, if you reject knowledge, I... He's not rejecting a sinner. He's not rejecting an atheist spitting in the face of God. He is rejecting someone who in some way or another is seeking him or coming to him. But he says, I don't accept your seek. I don't accept your praise. I don't accept your offer. I reject you. And the reason he rejects them is not because they're not coming to him. It is because they are coming to him in ignorance. Therefore, Isaiah, I believe it was, said, hell has enlarged herself. Well, I don't have time to preach that. Why has hell enlarged itself? To make room for ignorant people. It was created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for you. But it has enlarged itself to make room for stupid people. Oh, look at your neighbor and say, don't be that person. Don't be that person. If you reject knowledge... I will reject you. Paul told Timothy, you got fire, you got zeal, but here's what you need. Study. Study. I didn't say read. I said, sitting in your bed and falling asleep reading the book of Leviticus is not study." Trying to make your way through the genealogies is not study. Study generally requires more than one book. Study requires a highlighter. If you are studying and you don't have a highlighter and a pen and a notepad and a Bible and probably some other book or your phone accompanying it, then you are not studying. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be if you do not study, you will be ashamed. You will be faced with a situation, you will be faced with a circumstance that you are not able to meet it with the strength that you should have had and you will be ashamed at the defeat, you will be ashamed at the lack of faith, you will be ashamed at the position you find yourself in that you're even there. How many of you have ever been there before? Let's be honest. We're all human, we're all imperfect and we got ourselves into places we should not have been. If we would have just invested the time that we spend well I don't have any time Pastor Allen you are a liar you got the same 24 hours in a day everybody has and they've got and there are people all over the place that are working double shifts there are people all over the place that have 15 kids and yet they still get in the word they make time it's just you got things in your life that you don't want to give up you reject knowledge you reject me. Let's keep reading this verse. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee, and you shall be no priest. Priests are representatives. I'm not going to let you be my representative. You shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law of God. Now look at this. I also will forget your children. Ignorance is hereditary. See, ignorance, although it is prideful, although it is private, it, 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 it is not personal. It rubs off on somebody. You were supposed to have an influence on somebody's life. That's the reason why you should take notes when you're in church. Because when you take, see, notes, the hearing is for you, the notes are for them. 
If you're going to minister to somebody, you've got to have, so you're going to need, you are going to need this later. So you take the notes because you know that you'll need this information later. And you know they're going to need it later. So I must, I must write this down. I must get this information because God is giving it to me. You hear me? God is giving you this because somebody you're going to run into this week needs to know this. You're not here just to get built up all yourself. You're here because God is going to put someone in your path who needs this word. Not some other word that was preached at some other church. He brought you here to hear this word so that you could share it with somebody else. And it gets passed on to our children. Amen. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7 says, Wisdom is supreme. One translation says, So get wisdom, and if it costs you all you have, get understanding. Cost you all you have. Now, I'm going to show you why you're in the situation you're in. Spiritually, okay? Let's imagine just for a moment that you haven't eaten in days. You come into church, and I bless you with a $10 bill. And you've been craving a Big Mac or a Whopper or a Triple Classic. You want to go to Fuddruckers? I don't know. And you're hungry. And now you've got the money. But at the same time, there's a book on the way out that's being made available to you. You got $10. You're hungry both ways. You're hungry spiritually. And you're hungry naturally. So you get your wires crossed all the time. You think you're agitated. You know how agitated you get when you're naturally hungry? You know how you feel? Your whole body's crying out for it. Your emotions are crying out for it. Spiritually, you're that hungry. Everything in you is crying out for more. Everything in you wants to just sop it all up, but something's holding you back, and so you get your wires crossed, and you're frustrated, and you're lashing out at this person and at that thing, and the reality is is you're just hungry. So now you're presented with a decision. I just want to show you you. Am I going to feed my flesh? Where am I going to feed my spirit? Well, it's just a book. No, it's knowledge. It is information that it probably took that individual 20 years to accumulate. And you can get it in two hours. See, that food, the Bible says, he that sows to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to his spirit shall of his spirit reap life everlasting. So what are you going to feed in that moment? That tells you why you are where you are right now. Make the decision right now that whatever God's plan is, it is good. And even if it requires staving off natural hunger for a few more hours to satisfy some spiritual hunger, you're going to do it so that you can grow, so that you will not perish, and so that you will not be ashamed. This is how we will climb the mountain of God and not fall back into the valley. Knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Everybody say knowledge. Now your neighbors say, come on up a little bit higher. Here's what the Bible says. Arise and shine. For your... What is light? There's a word that's come to you. A revelation that's come to you. Arise. Get up out of that dark place. Get up out of that seated position. Receive the revelation he has for you. For darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness to people. But you, your light will be bright. See, you are the light of the world. Hallelujah. How about this? God is light. It's the same thing as saying God is his word. This, thy word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Its knowledge illuminates my path. This, 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 is, a, this is a container of the spiritual life and vitality of God Almighty. It is the only representative of God we have in the earth today, period. Other than his church, of course but that we have as his body. Light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
So God wants to impart this light. He wants to impart this knowledge. That's where your inheritance is. It is in knowledge. If you want to possess your land, fill your land with light. And if you will fill your land with light, if you will become a, a possessor of knowledge, if you'll make sure that every within every seat of your house, in every chair, on every couch, and on every bed, within reach from that spot is some knowledge. So that even if you take a second, don't have these lofty aspirations for yourself of sitting down and studying for hours. Grab it for 10 minutes and just look at it. During the, instead of fast-forwarding through commercials, just mute it through commercials and read during the commercials. Commit yourself to knowledge. And all you're getting, get it. And when you do this, you will begin to grow from the babe in the manger to the king that God has called you to be. Let's all turn to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Everybody turn there very quickly. Watch him, watch him, watch him. Come on, I don't hear anybody say watch him. <laughs> I don't want to say watch him. I want him to watch me. That's why I'm not saying it. Now, the mountain rep mountains represent kingdoms. So if we're raised to reign, that there's going to have to be a revelation of kingdom. Because you have to understand what God's called you to be. He has called you to be a king. Here's what it says in this verse. It says, did I give you the verse? 5.10. 5.10. <laughs> he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall on the The book of the Revelation, leave that verse up there. The book of the Revelation speaks of the kingdom of God coming down to the earth, doesn't it? It, it speaks of God, now listen to this, dwelling among. Now wait, we want to go dwell with him. But his desire is to. Now there is, that may seem like a distinction without a difference, but there is a difference there. It, God does not want us. See, the reason why we want to go to heaven is twofold. Number one, you want to see Jesus. But number two, primarily the reason why you want to go to heaven is because you're lazy. You're tired of paying your mortgage. You're tired of paying your rent. You're tired of paying your school bill. Tired of paying your electric bill. Tired of paying your water bill. Tired of paying your food costs. Tired of taking care of dirty diapers. Tired of being a secretary. Tired of having to dust your house and clean your house. Tired of having to deal with sickness. If I just get to heaven, I'll be free of all that stuff. So the main reason you want to go to heaven is because you're lazy. God doesn't want you in heaven. Where does he want you to reign? Now, heaven is a furlough. Heaven is a stop on the way to the ultimate plan and purpose of God for your life. You go into heaven. Don't get me wrong. You go in the glory to God, and it's going to be good. Thank God for the vacation. Amen. But you're not staying there. Read the end of the book. He will reign on this earth. He will establish his kingdom on this earth. And all his saints will come and reign with him on this earth. So you are being trained to reign right now. And he is watching you to see what he can make you lord over. And you're not going to reign like a president. You're not going to reign like an ambassador. You're not going to reign like a prime minister. You will reign as a king. That's the reason why God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Because he's not king of princes. A prince, whenever he, he is in the presence of the king, must remain a prince. He can only be king when he is outside of his king's And so God said, I must create a separate abode for man. Otherwise, if they remain with me in heaven, they are only princes. So I must create a separate abode for them on the earth. And on the earth, now they will, I will add legitimacy to their kingship and they can reign. 
So the kingdom is going to come down. God is going to come live among men instead of just men going to live among God. But he is training us to reign right here. All right. Look at Micah chapter 4 verse 9. Besides, you, you wouldn't be happy in heaven anyway. Got to smile after saying something like that. All, happiness only comes from fulfilling purpose. Now, that's deep all by itself. The only happiness you'll ever find is by embracing God's purpose for your life. That's the only happiness, real happiness, real joy that you'll ever attain by the fulfillment of the purpose that God has placed on your life. And since his purpose is not for you to just dangle your feet in the river of life forever, if you were to be forced to remain up there, you would not be fulfilled. You would not be fully happy because you are not doing what he's called you to do. Don't get me wrong. It'd be good for a while. But after a while, you'd get frustrated, like being on vacation. You know, it's good for a while. But after a while, you just got to get home. Where I don't have to worry about messing up the bed, and I don't have to worry about doing this, and I don't worry about doing that, and none, none, this is mine here. It belongs to me. Amen. I'm made to reign. Now look at this question here. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? It's a question I want to ask you today. Is there no king in you? He has made you to be kings and priests. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Isn't there something in you that wants to just take control of this situation? Isn't there something in you that wants to reign over this situation? Isn't there something in you that wants you to climb up to higher heights than you've ever been before, far above anything you've ever seen before? Isn't there something? Is there no king in you? You were created. You were born again to reign. And Heinz feet have the remarkable ability to find sure footing on the smallest of spaces, allowing it to climb almost effortlessly higher and higher and higher. In order for you to be where God's called you to be, in order for you to fulfill your purpose in Christ, he is going to have to make your feet lines high, like Heinz feet. Let me put it this way. You are going to have to receive the miracle of him making your feet like Heinz feet. You're going to have to actively pursue it. Why? Hind's feet have the unique ability to go up higher without needing much to stand on. And some of you are a little too needy. You need somebody to love you. You need somebody to wrap their arms around you. You need somebody to validate you. You need somebody to pat you on the back. You need somebody to tell you how wonderful you are. You need somebody to be with you. you need somebody to do this. You need somebody to do that. You need somebody to acknowledge. No, Hind's feet doesn't need any of that. It can stand on the smallest of ledges. It doesn't need anything to hold. It can be sure. It can be confident. All it needs is the word. It can just stand right there on the crevice of by his stripes. I am, And it can stand strong right there. It doesn't need much. All it needs is the word that says he sent his word and healed them. Doesn't need much. Oh, so, nudge your neighbor and say, I'm going to be like that. I don't need much. My God, I don't need much. I just need one word. I just need one word. I don't need much. I just need the church. I just need the church. I just I can stand right there on the church, stand strong. I don't need. I don't need much. I just need doctrine. I don't need your validation. I don't need that great worship service. I just need me some doctrine. Huh? I just need. I just need the cross. I don't need your psychology or your Dr. Phil. Just give me the cross. I've got it. That's all I need. That's all I need. I can rejoice with the knowledge of the cross all the days of my life. That's all I need. Hind's feet have the remarkability to find sure footing. God is imparting sure footedness. I don't need much. All I need is the Christ of unsearchable riches. And he has provided an inheritance for me. Blessed be his holy name. Stand up on your feet with me. Stand up on your feet with me.
God is about to impart sure-footedness whereby we may be able to escape from any menace or chase down any enemy. So every head bowed now, every eye closed. I want to know who in this place is going to commit with me on this first service in 2016 that I'm going to become a pursuer of knowledge. I'm, I'm going to become a person who pursues light. I'm going to become the light of the world. I, I want to seek after knowledge. I want to grow. I want to read. I want to, I want to learn. I want to receive. I want to hear. When I say three, but you need help doing it, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I want to become this year a passionate pursuer of the light of God, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord on the mountain. Father, we don't know how. We know we must, but we've got so many things burdening us, so many things weighing us down, so many things making our feet too heavy. Help us. Help us to see clearly. Help us remove to remove this burden. In fact, this day we cast all our care, all our anxiety, all our worry. We cast you, you don't do it for us. We cast it. We cast it over onto you. Take it. Take that weight. Take that burden. Take that darkness. I receive knowledge. I thank you, Lord, that after this day, there's more light in my life. More knowledge in my life after this service. More glory in my life after this service. Less of the enemy, more of God. I'm growing. I'm getting higher and higher and higher. Pray this prayer with me. In the name of Jesus, I receive knowledge. I am, in 2016, a diligent seeker. For he will make my feet like hinds feet. And I was born to reign. There is a king in me, and that king has authority, has power, has a praise that I offer to you now. In Jesus' name.